All right, welcome to Back to Back to Basics. Um, I know many of you, as I look at the participant screen, were here yesterday for some of the sessions. I hope you enjoyed them. Um, this morning, we're gonna go through the contract to close process. And I'm gonna share with you a couple of my resources that I've shared in some of the other classes, um, but just kind of give you some good resources and tips to help everything stay smooth in your contract to close process with your transactions. So I know that um, you know many of you that are on, we've got some people that are brand new. We've got people that have been in the business for quite a while. We've got brokers on. Um, if any of you have, have things to share or other ideas, things that have worked for you, by all means, please chime in. Um, again, either do so in that chat or you can unmute yourself and um, talk as well. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen. Oh, I gotta go back here. See if I can get skip back. There we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? Hopefully you can. If you cannot see my screen, good. Thank you for the thumbs up, Michelle. I appreciate it. Um, don't forget for those that are on that came on a few minutes late, find that chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and please type something in the chat. That way I can download that and keep track of um, who attended today and who is here. Thank you all for being here this morning. All right, so we're going to talk about, yesterday we talked about um, perfecting our paperwork, uh, both with listings and with sales contracts, what to do once you have a sale, once you have a new listing, how to get things turned in properly. And today we're going to talk about our contract to close process. So I'm going to pick up kind of where we left off yesterday. Um, you know, once your paperwork is turned in, what do you do next and what do you need to do? And we're going to focus on um, kind of three different sections, although they're woven together a little bit, kind of the behind the scenes, what you're doing as the agent, and then what you do when you, as you're working with buyers and what you need to be doing as you're working with sellers. So one of the things that I'm going to share with you, and I'm going to click right into it. We're going to spend some time here in this checklist and I'm going to show you where you have access to this. I've made this available for everybody. Um, it's easy to find in drive. I'll show you in just a second where you can find this in drive. Um, but this is, and I keep adding to this checklist. Every time I do a class, somebody comes up with some great, you forgot this. So this is a living, breathing checklist that we continue to update as we get new um, tools and services and resources from both Kansas City Homes and also BHGRE. Um, we'll add to these as well. For instance, like the Boost program with HomeSpotter, that's in here. Um, so let me just click in here and show you this spreadsheet. Hopefully you can see this okay. I'm gonna try to zoom in a little bit. There we go, does that look a little bit better? Maybe try one, let me try one more zoom here. Get it as big as I can, take up the full screen. Does that look okay for everybody? Okay, so this is my master buyer and seller checklist. I'm gonna show you real quick where you're gonna find this. A um, Couple different places that I'm gonna put it for you. Let me open a, a new tab here. First place I'm gonna go show you is in Google Drive. Um, make sure as you're doing this, you're logged in. I'm clicking, just mousing over my picture up here. Make sure you're logged into your KansasCityHomes.com account. Otherwise you won't see these options that I'm getting ready to show you. Right next to that is my waffle. And I'm going to click on drive here. And over here on the left hand side, I'm going to go right underneath my drive. I'm going to go to shared drives. I don't want to go to shared with me. I want to click right up here on shared drives. And these are the drives that you have access to. Now I've got access to all of the office drives and you're not going to have access to those. You'll have access to the agent marketing, agent training, and then your office um, as well. So you'll probably have three on here. You won't have as many as me, but it's, that's okay. Um, we're going to go into agent training. Agent training is the Google, that's the share drive where I dump everything from the classes, any resources, any videos. Um, they all get dumped and housed in here. And then they're also on BH Genius as well um, for easier viewing. But most of your click-throughs that are on BH Genius bring you right into here for the resources. 
So I have right on the front page here of agent training now, I've got the master buyer and seller checklist. So if you come into here and click on this, you're gonna open up right into this buyer seller checklist. When you open it up, you are gonna have a view only copy. So you need to make a copy of it so you can take it, download it to your own drive or put it in Excel and customize this, take out my notes, um, add your own steps that you have, but this at least gives you a good template to start with. I'm gonna zoom out just so I feel like that's, we're almost too close there. Okay. Um, so that's one place you're gonna be able to find it. The other place that I wanna show you real quick is on Genius. If you've not been here this week, um, I'll show you something that I worked on last week as we're clicking through here. I'm gonna click right here on this, this banner, um, fast, fast access to video training. And I did this last week. We had this huge long list down here of all this training that we've been offering um, and it was not organized and it was driving me nuts. So I took all our big long list and other videos as well and organized them here into categories. So you'll notice down here is the Back to Basics series. When you click on this, this is a page that's just gonna house our Back to Basics stuff. So perfecting your paperwork from yesterday, the video is up there, and then I put the slide deck. When you click on the slide deck, it's clicking you through to that Google Drive. So you can download, you can print your own copy. And then the video here of calculating net sheets. After we finish this morning's class, I'll take the video, I'll put the video from this morning up and I'll also put a link right in here to this spreadsheet. Um, so two different places you can find it. You can either come in here to Genius or you can find it in the agent training on the shared drive. So both ways, both ways there. Any questions on how to access that? before I dive into the actual spreadsheet. Okay. I just moved something and now it's right in my way down there on the screen with Zoom. Okay, so let's get back in here to the spreadsheet. And the spreadsheet is broken into two different, um, two different tabs. You'll notice along the, along the bottom. I've got this open in Google Sheets. Um, if you open it in Excel, it might look slightly different, but it's gonna be about the same. But you'll notice on the bottom, I've got a seller checklist and a buyer checklist. And this is more than just contract to close. Today, we're gonna to focus on contract to close. Um, but these checklists really take you start to finish when you're working with buyers and sellers. Um, these are great checklists to either have in your um, digital files or to have printed off in your um, paper files, either way. Um, we're going to pick up this one after um, contract acceptance here. We're going we're to pick it up kind of in the middle of here um, on the buyer side and then same with the seller side as well. But you'll notice up here, just give you a little tour of this, um, we've got it broken down here into different categories. So this is going to be, and I need to change that verbiage, it's not task up there. Um, this is kind of your initial consultation with your buyer. <coughs> you can take some notes. There's a column here to take notes. Once you meet with them, you can put in who their pre-approval is from, their contact information, check off that they've signed a buyer agency, check off that you've set them up on an online search, and then it takes you into preparing the offer, everything that you need, You'll notice over here on the agent note side, I have linked here to my templates. I have templates available for you all to take and use and customize, do whatever you want to with. Um, so for instance, the quick glance cover sheet for a listing agent. This is a template that I use when I am writing an offer, um, when I deliver the offer to the other agent, especially with multiple offers. Um, this is an awesome sheet that they really appreciate that has kind of the buyer's offer, just the high level details of the contract that then is attached under it. Um, so you'll notice on the spreadsheet, you've got this whole column and any templates that I have, and we're gonna click through a lot of these today and talk about these as they relate to contract to close, um, they sit right over here under the agent notes. So this notes here, that's for you. When you download, make a copy of this, you'll have access um, and you can put your own notes into here and you can delete this column. Um, that way it's not, not clouding up your, your spreadsheet. There's also a couple of videos links in here as well. Up here at the top, um, there's a link here to watch the full buyer best practice class where we go through all of this in detail. You're getting a lot of it today. 
Um, but that's up there at the top. And then a couple on um, agent notes, I don't have them as much on the buyer, but over on the, on the um, seller checklist, for instance, here on, uh, on six, set up home compare. If you don't know how to do that, you click right here and it'll take you right over to YouTube and you can watch how to set up a uh, potential client in home compare. So lots of stuff going on in this spreadsheet. Um, lots of stuff going on here, but let's go back over here to the buyer spreadsheet and let's talk about kind of contract to close as it relates to buyer. <coughs> I'm going to kind of work our way down through this. At this point, um, we've got an offer accepted. We've turned in our paperwork that falls right down here. So I'm going to skip over that one. Um, the one thing that I I want to impress upon you is during the contract to close process, it's critical that you maintain your communication with your clients. Um, in some steps, it's easier to do than others, but I've given you some links to templates here. The first thing that I do when I have a buyer that goes under contract is I send them a link or I send them an email that has um, basically information for them on, okay, we're under contract. Congratulations. Here's our next steps. And it also includes an in inspection explanation sheet. Now I go through that when I do my initial buyer consultation with them, but at that point it's going right over their head. They're so you know, energized and excited about going out and finding the right house that they're not worried yet about inspections. Um, so I make sure I reiterate and set these expectations for them um, every step of the way. So once we're under contract, I'll just give you a quick preview of this. Um, it'll open up for you. You can either open it up in Microsoft Word or in Google Docs. Um, but if you take this, you can copy the whole thing and throw it into an email and customize it. But this just tells them um, kind of an overview of inspections, how much they cost in general, and then my list of preferred inspectors. Um, I have a link in here as well. You'll notice on this last bullet point um, to, we talked about this yesterday with, I think it was in the calculating net sheets class with inspections. I try to keep my advice to them with inspections very broad. I don't want to tell them, okay, if we're just doing whole house rate on and termite, anything else you want to add on? Well, they don't know what else they want to add on. So I try to give them a little guidance, but I want to make sure I keep it really broad so they can't come back later and say, well, you know, there was an issue with mold and you never told us we could even get a mold inspection. Well, there's a lot of inspections you can get. Um, you know, we don't always go over every one of those with our buyers. So I link to an article in here that gives them a whole long list of inspections and that way it covers my rear end. With that, I also include this um, inspection explanation that is attached. And this basically walks them through contractually how this inspection period is going to roll out. So this is important client communication. It tells them what happens after the inspection, what they need to prepare for with the inspection, that they need to be there for at least at minimum the last half hour, et cetera. So that gets attached with that other email. Um, which is kind of nice. It's good communication for them. So as we work our way down here, um, the other thing that I like doing, and sometimes I'll just include this in my email, is um, this sheet that has important dates and contacts for the buyers. This also keeps me, this is more for me really than the buyers, um, but what our contract effective date is, our um, inspection time period, um, what day we're doing the inspection, when our walkthrough is going to be, our closing date, our possession date, and then any important contacts, or our lender, our title company, et cetera. Um, this is a good sheet that keeps me organized as well. So really important, we talked about this yesterday in the processing, the paperwork, but anything, you know, we're, we're typically really good about giving the um, title company and the lender our paperwork on our initial submission, but please make sure that as you have any amendments that come through, um, your resolution, anything that changes the price of the house, the terms of the contract, make sure as you're sharing that with processing, you're also always, always, always send it to title company and the lender. Um, right down here, I've got some, some check marks for you that you've sent it to the office processor, the lender and the title company. And then there's a note over here. If you're sharing these in dot loop, make sure that you click that little box that says attach it PD to PDF or attach as PDF. Um, oftentimes the lenders and some of the title companies can't get into dot loop to pull everything out. So I always um, click that, that little button in dot loop that um, tomorrow afternoon we're doing a dot loop basics class and I'll show you where that is in dot loop. But just a tip for you there. Um, 
The other thing that you want to make sure that you impress upon the buyers during their inspection period, and I've got um, a line about it in that template that I email to them, but make sure that they're also reaching out to their homeowner's insurance carrier um, or shopping for homeowner's insurance during the inspection time period. That's really important. You don't want to get a surprise. Oftentimes buyers don't start shopping for that until two weeks before closing when the lender says, hey, who are you using for home insurance? I need the bill um, you know, for closing. And then they start shopping for it. And then all of a sudden you find out that the roof is uninsurable or there's an issue with, with something, have them shop for that. Make sure they're shopping for that during their inspection time period. That's really important, very important. As a buyer's agent, you're responsible for scheduling the inspections. Um, I have a on here, you know, keep track of which inspections are going to do when your inspection time period expires, um, you know, per the contract. It's that's based that that um, time period. It defaults to 10 calendar days. It's not business days and the calendar days. If I have an effective date of today, my number, my first calendar day is going to be tomorrow. So your effective date is zero. The next day is one and then you count out to 10. If it's 10, if it's 14, it's 14. But it's important that you do that um, and know going in what that inspection um, time period expiration date is. And then once you complete inspections, of course, you're gonna spend your, send your inspection notice to the listing agent resolution. You, ha you do have to spend, and we're gonna spend some time on this tomorrow morning when we talk about the inspection process and how to keep things from going off the rails. Um, make sure when you're, when you're sending that inspection notice, regardless of what option they choose, if they're canceling, if they're taking the house as is, you need to send the inspection report per the contract. You've gotta provide the inspection reports. Any questions on that? I know that that has been a little bit of a, a, of a confusing, there's been some confusion around that in the past. And I just wanna make sure that everybody understands that you've gotta send your inspection reports. Christian, it's Lisa. Hi Can Lisa. Me? Yeah. Um, okay, real quick about that. So um, I just wanna clarify, when you say when they're taking it, in its present conditions, they've done the inspections. Um, is are you saying when you send the that you have to send the inspection notice no matter what? Yes, you need to yes. send an inspection yes. notice regardless, even if they're taking it in the present condition. And if you send the inspection report, you have to uh, attach all of the inspections that you've done. Say that again, you cut out there for just a second. Sorry, you have to attach all of the inspections that you've done. Um, yes, you are supposed uh, yeah, to attach all, all inspections. inspections. Okay, and then in the case where a home has gone under, I'm representing the buyer and the home has gone under contract, but it fell through and the, the other buyers did inspections Therefore, the buyers, uh, the buyers' inspections are all, you know, on MLS as part of the supplements. Do you recommend that my buyers do their own inspections? Um, a practitioner. Hold on just a second. I'm going to mute you. Okay, I'm going to mute you while I'm talking because um, I'm getting some weird feedback. So once I finish talking, you can unmute. Um, so we're going to discuss this in detail tomorrow when we talk about inspections, but to answer your question as a practitioner, I highly recommend that you encourage the buyers to make sure that they are aware that they can get their own inspections and that they need to get their own inspections. Um, we've had some, some legal issues, not with our company, but I've seen some legal issues, uh, you know, in the past couple of years where a buyer thought that they had to, had to use the previous inspection and the agent really didn't educate them on the fact that they could get their own inspection. They didn't have to use that inspection. So I think it's, it's, it comes down to the buyer's choice, but I think you need to educate them and make sure they understand that, that you know, if they're comfortable with this, with the inspection report that's already here, fine. Um, that's their choice, but they have the, the opportunity to have their own independent inspector done or inspection done. So I think it's important to educate them on it. Again, it's their choice. 
um, but make sure that you're informing them of all of this and do it in writing. Do it in writing. Hopefully that answered your question. I'm going to unmute you, Lisa. Do you have any other questions or did that, did that answer it? It, it did. I, I, um, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm literally waiting to hear back at 10 a.m. about an offer we did and this is the situation I'm in. So, um, very helpful because I, I struggle with that. <laughs> yes, it's a tough one, but it, you know, at the end of the day, it's the buyer, it's, we have to educate the buyers and then the buyers make the decisions. So, but I would definitely tell them, don't try to try to persuade them one way or another, um, you know, just educate them and then let them, let them make that, make that determination. Um, I pulled up an inspection notice on here. I think that it is, I know that a lot of agents, um, you know, when you're taking a house as is, after inspections, people don't think you need an inspection notice. You really do. Um, you need the inspection notice because if you don't give the inspection notice, <laughs> your inspection time period expires. And what happens when your inspection time period expires? Either party can cancel. Um, so you, you need to, you know, even if they're taking it as is, you've got a um, checkbox here that they did inspections and they were acceptable or they did not do inspections. And I think it's important for us as practitioners to cover our rear ends to have this documentation. Um, if we don't have this documentation in the file, that's, that's an issue. That is an issue. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I know we've got a couple questions in chat on inspection stuff because we're going to cover that in great detail in the session tomorrow. Today, I just want to focus really on kind of the back end, the paperwork, the process, et cetera. And then tomorrow, we're really going to dive into inspections and kind of troubleshoot those, those issues that come up with the inspection process. Um, Daly, you are supposed to provide all inspection reports. Um, again, we'll Thank talk you. about that in more detail tomorrow. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, Paula said she thinks that you only have to share in inspections if you're using that as a way to cancel the contract. Um, I believe that it's written into the base contract that, that you're to provide um, copies of uh, you can see right here in the inspection notice, boxes two and three, you're supposed to provide copies of written inspection reports in their entirety. So all of them. And then down here, offer to renegotiate in their entirety, all of them. You can't pick and choose which ones you send. Again, we'll discuss this in more detail tomorrow. So hang on to these inspection related questions. Once you're through inspections, um, you got your inspection notice, you have your resolution, those need to be shared with your processor, with the um, with your office um, admin, whoever's processing your files, and then also the title company and the lender, especially if there's a change in the price, especially if there's a change in the price. And again, we'll talk about that in more detail because there's, you know, there's some different dif differing opinions on whether if there's a change in price, you put that on a resolution or an amendment. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll hang on to that little nugget um, and save that one for tomorrow. Okay, so moving along here, this is a biggie right here, uh, line 30 down here. When received, verify all information on the title commitment. Um, if you don't read those, you're not alone. Most agents don't. A lot of agents never even read a title commitment. Um, they get it. They either ignore the email or they, you know, email it right into their loop, stick it in there, print it off, stick it in the file. But it is really, really important to actually look at your title commitment. Um, I'm going to show you why. I'm going to click into this title commitment. This is on a transaction that, um, that closed just this last month. And we received this, and luckily I, I use um, Amy both at Security First Title, and she is just amazing, and she usually catches all of these, but she doesn't catch every single one of them. But we um, received this title commitment. Luckily, she was on it, and I got the email from her as I was reading this. Um, but I want to give you a quick tour of what a title commitment looks like, and then also um, show you where you really need to focus when you pull these open, when you pull these open. Um, the front page is usually just the commitment to issue the policy, um, the, the notice from First American Title. <clears throat> now, the issuing agent on here is Security First Title. They get their title commitments from First American Title. So 
just know that's who's issuing these. Um, if you receive these and it has First American Title at the top, it doesn't mean that that's your closer. Right down here is who's issuing this, okay? So Schedule A is the first thing you're gonna come to, and this gives you who the issuing agent is, the property address. You wanna double check that and make sure it's correct. Um, who the buyer is, the title officer that the buyer is using, the escrow officer the seller is using, and then under Schedule A, you've got the commitment date. So when was this pulled? And then um, who, they're, who they're insuring, the policy amount, which should be your purchase price, um, talks about how the, um, how the land is held or how it's described. This is a fee simple. And then who it's vested to right now. You wanna check this, make sure the seller's names are correct, especially if you have a seller, seller's name that's a common name. This one's common, Eric Nelson. Um, and I'm gonna show you in just a second how common it is. But make sure that those are spelled correctly. And then that the, the um, lot description is correct as well. So lot description is, or uh, your legal tax description is critical on this, critical on this. So down here, it's gonna go, Schedule B talks about the requirements that need to happen to transfer title. Um, and a lot of this is, you're gonna see this language on every single title commitment that you read. The stuff that is in bold down here, starting at five, these are the things that are um, pertinent to this transaction and that are unique to this transaction. So if you look at nothing else on the title commitment, go to Schedule B and look at the bold things and make sure that all of those are correct. As I'm scanning this, I see that payment for taxes um, have to be made. That's normal. Um, those are the taxes as of today that have not been paid. They don't have a tax lien or they don't have a lien on the property for their property taxes. Um, this is normal. Those are gonna be paid at closing. I showed you yesterday how to calculate that um, in our net sheet class. And then we've got that a um, that they've got to release the mortgage that was dated February 20th. Blah, 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 blah. Um, this is a great, you know, at this point you can confirm what they told you was their approximate payoff. And then this one, I can see that there's a second on the house as well. So I know that there's a first and a second here. I compare that to my net sheet that I gave the seller um, to make sure that I had correct information. And then down here in eight, is where we have an issue on this one. So there was a tax warrant that was issued on November 10th, 2016 against Erica Nelson and Eric Nelson in the amount of $524 plus interest in, um, and costs. Now, this wasn't my Eric Nelson. This wasn't my client. It got attached to his house inadvertently because of this other Eric Nelson and his wife, Erica. So Amy sends me an email and says, okay, can you verify for me, uh, was Eric ever married to an Erica or related to an Erica? And so they dug, the title company dug in. Um, I had to put the seller in, in touch with Amy and they dug in and, and, and got this removed. And it wasn't an issue. It didn't cause a delay in closing because as soon as we got this title commitment on May, when was this? May 5th, we had a new title commitment within five days and this got cleared. So you want to pay attention to the stuff down here that's in bold. Not all of our sellers are the most forthcoming with information, especially if it's kind of embarrassing information that they have a tax lien on the property or they didn't pay their HOAs for a couple of years and that's sitting on the property and they don't realize that that is going to be on the title commitment and that the, those things either have to get cleared prior to closing or they're going to have to get cleared with proceeds at closing. Um, but we're going to have to address them one way or another. And what you don't want are surprises. So as soon as you receive this title commitment, you need to look at it. You need to scan it. And like I said, if you look at nothing else, come to Schedule B and look at the stuff in bold and make sure it's your standard things. Um, that there's nothing funky in here like what's here on number eight. And if there is, you immediately reach out to your closer and your, and your client and let them know, you know, verify, you know, don't assume that it's incorrect. It might, might have been correct. It might, Eric and his sister, Erica, um, that might have been correct, but let the title company handle that with the, with the seller and verify and then um, address it as, as needed. Any questions on that before I, I move on? Does anybody have anything else to add about title commitment um, when it's received that I haven't touched on? Uh, 
I think, Kristen, when we receive this title commitment, it's our responsibility to send it to the seller or the, or the buyer. That is correct, yes. That is correct. You not only and do you want to put it, a copy of it in your file, but you also want to send it to your client as well. And that's the only person we need to send it to. That is, well, you need to send it, you need to put it in your, um, in your file to go to processing. Yes. So your office processor is going to want a copy of this. So what I do when I receive it is I come, let's, um, uh, who'd this come from? It was Jamie. Unless they've been copied on it, the processor should have it and also your client should have it and you should have a copy. Correct. Correct. So when I received this email, this is the updated title commitment when they got it removed. Again, it was, you know, six days later here. I take this and I put this up into dot loop and then I share it with the title company already has it. The lender doesn't need it, but I share it with um, Terry at the Blue Valley office who processes our sales. And then I share it with my seller as well. Or Thank with my buyer, if it's my buyer. Any other questions about title commitment? So you said the lender does not need it. Um, typically it's sent to the lender. The title company will send it to the lender. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions on title commitment? Down here in Schedule B Part 2, um, a lot of this it talks about the property, if there's any easements on the property, um, right of ways, et cetera. It tells you in seven um, that the taxes, I know from looking at this, the taxes are current, what the current taxes are, the mill levy rate. Down here, it's any, um, any easements, that it is subject to covenants, conditions, restrictions. So just some more information about the property itself. Um, section, um, Schedule B Part 1 is really about the parties, and then Schedule B Part 2 is really about the property. But again, you want to review this. Make sure this all looks correct. Make sure, I, I always look at this, make sure there's not some crazy easement on the property that nobody knows about. What if there's a, you know, an old, really old, you know, land use rider on the property for oil or so you don't, you just don't know. You want to look at this. You want to look at this, scan it, make sure there's nothing that looks funky. And if there is, reach out to the title company and ask for an explanation or, or do some digging. Have them dig for you. Okay, I'm going to move on. I'm going to have this open twice. Close that one. Okay, so this is my process. You might do things a little different and that's totally fine. Um, this checklist is, I created this years ago and have just added to it over the years. Um, and this is my process. You might do things in a different order. But typically I wait until we have an agreed upon resolution. And at that point it triggers me to order the home warranty if applicable. Um, I don't like ho ho ordering the home warranty prior through us going through inspections because I really don't want to have to go in and do duplicate work and, you know, delete it, cancel it if, if the buyer is not moving forward. So I wait until we're through resolution. I typically am waiting until we're through resolution to um, green light the appraisal to the lender. The lenders and, you know, I like to wait until we know at least we've done inspections. We know things aren't going to fall apart before my buyers incur the cost of having an appraisal done on a property. I don't like, unless we've got a pretty condensed um, escrow period, uh, I don't want them to have to incur that cost if we're not going to move forward because of an inspection related issue. So Eric asked a question in chat. Do I sit down with the buyer and go over it? Um, Eric, are you referring to the title commitment? If so, no, I don't sit down and go through that title commitment with them. I'm emailing it to them and when I email it to them, I ask them to review it and let me know if they have any questions. Okay, yes, that's what it was. Thank you. That's one, that's a document that, that you know, you really don't need, need to sit down necessarily with them, but I do offer to, to explain anything or answer any questions. Typically, if they have questions about it, I'm referring them to Amy at, at Security First. Um, and having her explain it to them because some of those things 
um, or out of my area of expertise. So again, working down here after agreement to the resolution, we've talked about sending the inspection notice to processing, to your lender, to title company, and then we green light the appraisal. At this point, after you get through your resolution, <laughs> depending on how long you have, you know, if you've got a 45, 60 day close, you're really kind of in a holding pattern. Um, until you get through the appraisal, I do reach out and, and touch base with the, um, the uh, seller's agent at this point to let them know we've ordered the appraisal. They should be hearing from them. If you don't hear, them by X, hear from them by X date, let me know, um, but give them a heads up. The appraiser is going to reach out to, they're not going to reach out to you as a buyer's agent. They're going to reach out to the listing agent. And if the listing agent doesn't communicate with you, you might never know that the appraiser has actually been to the property. So I try to keep that line of communication open with the agent. So I at least have a heads up as to when the appraiser is going to be at the property. And then we've got an idea of when we think that appraisal might come back. And typically it takes a few days for it to come back, sometimes up to a week, um, depending on how crazy they are. So our next section down here, I've got this as two weeks prior to closing. And two weeks prior to closing is when I'm reaching out to the title company to set up there at, at minimum two weeks before closing. If I'm closing at the end of the month, it's probably three weeks because um, the title companies get pretty backed up at the end of the month. Um, just a, a word of advice, when I'm writing a contract, I try to avoid closing on Fridays and I try to avoid closing on the last day of the month. Um, those are typically just insane for the title companies. Um, the reason I don't like closing on Fridays is if there's any sort of delay whatsoever and all of a sudden, you know, we can't close on Friday and we have to go to the next business day, we're then going into a Monday. And guess what? All the buyer's stuff is all put on a U-Haul and sitting out in front of the house ready to be unloaded and all of a sudden they can't move into the property until Monday until we close. So I make sure to, to try to schedule closings for Thursdays. That way, if there is any sort of delay or an issue, um, we at least have Friday to, to make up for it. And they're not sitting there over the weekend with all their stuff in, in a truck and nowhere to go. Park it in at my house. Um, <clears throat> so that's my little blurb about setting up your closing time. I also schedule the walkthrough at that point. Um, all of these kind of happen at the same time through an email that I send to my, to my buyers. So let's take a look at this email real quick. At this, again, you know, your communication with your clients during this time is critical. Don't make them guess. Um, a lot of their contact at this point, this is when the lender and, and the buyers are doing the heavy lifting on the transaction. Um, don't fall into the back seat and ignore the buyers. Make sure that they know that you're, you know, you're still on top of things, things are progressing, check in with them on a weekly basis. It doesn't have to be a big formal email. I've got a couple that are sent to them throughout the process. This is one that's pretty critical that is sent to them at, I try to send it right at the two week prior to closing, um, closing mark. And in this email, I talked to them about scheduling our final walkthrough. I'm gonna open this in, um, doc so you can see it it's kind of blurry as i open it there again you have access to this um, and i'll show you where all of these live in the agent training drive um, but you can take this and literally highlight it copy it and paste it into gmail and change change some stuff um, but i prepare them for the final walkthrough um, i prepare them that it'll likely be a disaster that's going to be covered in boxes and it's not going to be in show condition um, and then closing, um, once I've got their closing date and time, which at this point I have, uh, I tell them where that is, the date, the time, where they're going, what they need to bring, um, when they're gonna get their amount that they need to bring to closing, and then how that amount needs to be brought, either in a cashier's check, um, I tell them no personal checks are accepted. If they wanna do a wire, let me know and I'll make those arrangements directly with security first. Um, I have my blurb in there just about wire fraud. And then I talk to them about possession, remind them what we agreed to with the, with the contract. Um, in this contract, they received possession at 5 p.m. on the 16th. So I wanted to prepare them for how that is going to work. 
and then utilities are a biggie. At this point, you need them to call and start setting up their utilities. And I have um, obviously some listed here. There's, these aren't gonna be the same for every house, um, but in my template email, I can go in here then and change, you know, if it's, um, you know, uh, I can't remember, Missouri Gas, what's the name of the gas company in Missouri? I can't remember off the top of my head. Um, I can go in here and change this information, swap this information in and out. I also will give them information here if there is some, it, uh, an HOA that they need to get connected with because the um, HOA uh, deals with the trash and the recycle pickup. Um, if they have a website, um, I try to connect them with all the resources they need as they're moving into the house at this point. Spire, thank you. So that's the email that the buyers get from me about two weeks prior to closing. And that also kind of keeps me on track. I know it, when that email is going out, I know that at that point I've got to have, have scheduled their closing to get that information in. At that point, I'm scheduling the walkthrough. I'm doing all the final details on the back end. Um, that's also the point that I order their closing gift. Um, make sure that I've got arrangements for that. I order these custom um, nice big block um, cutting boards that have the GPS coordinates of their house really pretty and that it says home, established, whatever. But um, people do many different things for closing gifts. Lots of good ideas, um, but I try to do that so I'm not scrambling the night before and they end up with a gift card to Home Depot. Although some of them, that's what they want. Um, a week prior to closing, I am doing a final check with, um, with Terry. Uh, who is my processor at Blue Valley to make sure that there are no missing documents. I can actually do that check now in Skyslope, which I showed you yesterday in our paperwork class. Um, I can go to my checklist that she emails me and I can see at a glance if I'm missing anything. Um, if I am, that's when I want to want to address those things. And then I'm reaching out to the listing agent to get any repair receipts, invoices, from the listing agent, from the sellers, if there were repairs that were to be done. I like to have those in hand and printed off when we go back for the walkthrough, so we can go through those. Um, with the walkthrough, I don't like scheduling that the day of closing or the night before closing. I tell my buyers I like to schedule that at least 48 hours prior to closing, so if there is an issue, we have time to address it. If the movers put a big hole in the wall, there is time to address it. If a repair is not done, there is time to address it. And we don't have freak out mode from all the parties. Um, I also prepare a new home information sheet for the buyers. I'll show you what that looks like. <coughs> but this just gives them some details. And this is when I go to the closing um, and I'm present, whether it's today when we can't sit right next to them and I just have to give this to them out in the parking lot, but I have a folder for them um, and I'll share with you in a minute what's in that, but this is at the top of the folder and this has any pertinent details that they need. Their garage code, the alarm code, what's the trash day, trash service, if it's done through the HOA, I try to figure out how they connect that if they haven't already. Um, the homes association information is in there. If they have a home warranty, I put who the home warranty company is, the policy number and the contact info, and then any vendors. So if I know as soon as they move in, they're having tile ripped out and redone, I'll give them some of my um, tile people. Or if I know the roof is gonna be replaced, we already have the estimate, we know the company that's doing it, I'll put that contact information on here as well. So anything that they're gonna need, critical information that they're gonna need as they walk into the front door of their new house goes on this sheet. And then upon closing, this is your back end stuff. Um, again, you wanna make sure that you customize this for your processes. Um, I've got in here pretty general. You wanna update your CRM or your spreadsheet, however you keep track of your clients. <coughs> Excuse me. Update your mailing list. That should be different than your CRM. Um, once you have a copy from the title company of the signed uh, settlement statement, we used to call it a HUD, we don't need more, the settlement statement, I print a copy of that and I put it in my paper file. And then I also make sure that I upload a copy of it to dot loop. Um, when I'm in dot loop and we'll cover this again tomorrow, I create folders in there. And one of the folders that I create in my loops, I'll show you this real quick. Let me find one here. Have I created theirs yet? 
Um, I've not created theirs yet, but I need to. So I'll create a folder now that this is closed and the folder will be all of our post-closing documents. So in there will be their settlement statement, any documents that I receive after closing, I'm gonna put in that folder that way. And it's right there at the top of the loop for me. And that way when they call me and say, hey, do you have a copy of that? I need a copy of it or, or whatever. I'm not looking through a long list of all of these documents. Um, they're all organized. You can see right here, they're all organized into folders for me. I like to keep things very organized in dot loop. It drives me nuts when there's just long lists of documents in no particular order. Again, I will cover that tomorrow in dot loop basics. Um, but that's what I do with the final settlement statement once I receive it. And then I want to make sure that I am sending a testimonial request, whether that's through Real Satisfied, through Zillow, through um, bhgre.com, whatever I choose to send them a testimonial through, I want to make sure that I'm doing that. And then last but not least, I want to make sure that I claim my sale on Zillow. Um, if you didn't do the Polish Your Profiles class or haven't taken one of my classes on updating your profiles online, um, your sales do not feed to Zillow. So if you want to look like you've done any business whatsoever, you need to be going on to Zillow and claiming your sales. It's much easier to do it one by one as you close on things than sitting there and, and not doing it for three years and having to update three years worth of transactions. Um, Pam put in here and send a postcard. Absolutely. There's things that I know that you all do. I kept this list really general. Um, and then I've got a section down here because you all have your own plans for staying in touch. If, um, you know, one of the things that you might do is go ahead and set them up on our monthly newsletter to start receiving that if they don't already. Um, you know, set them up on, I set them up on my home compare. Uh, they just bought a house. What, what do they want to know? Every time a sign goes up in the yard, they're calling me going, how much is that house listed for? They want to know they got a good deal, um, but they can kind of keep track of what's going on in the neighborhood. So I go ahead and set them up in home compare and I tell them at closing that I'm going to do that. But you can put your own stuff down here as far as what you do to stay in touch with, with your clients. Um, so this is, any questions? I know I've gone through this and I've not paused a whole lot to ask questions. Um, any questions on that side of the, of the check, of our checklist here? Our contract to close with buyers. Again, this, your contract to close communication is critical. Um, something that's not in here that, that I would suggest doing is make sure you're having weekly, um, either whether it's an email, a text, a phone call with the lender, just to see how things are progressing. Make sure your client's getting them the information that they need, that there's no hangups. Um, oftentimes if there's an issue, they'll let you know, but not everyone will. Um, they might not let you know that the buyers have been really slow about getting documents to them. And you can maybe step in and help nudge them a little bit um, and help with that. So make sure that your communication is on point, not just with the buyer, but with all parties and, and, the co and your co-op agent as well. Checking in with them. Okay, let's flip over here to the seller one. And um, the seller checklist is we're going to pick up on this one da, 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 right after receiving and presenting offers. So upon offer acceptance um, is where we're going to pick up on this one. Lots of duplication here from the buyer side. So I'm really just, as we go through this, um, we have about 10 minutes left. I'm really just going to hit on the things that are different and unique for the buyer side. Um, one of the things that I like to send, I think sellers get ignored when we're in this contract to close. Um, again, I said it's, you've got to be on point with your communication with buyers, but even more so with the sellers. The most stressful part of a transaction for a seller is the inspections. Prepare them just like you do a buyer for what happens during the inspection process. I've got a link in here to a template email that I send to my sellers as soon as we're under contract and explain to them, here's what happens next. This also explains to them that I don't want them at the house for inspections. Someone's got to tell them that. Um, and it has to be us. <laughs> and then how many times do the inspector comes and I'll text the client and say, agent just texted me, they're wrapping up, you're free to go home. And what is the next text you receive? Where's a report? What do they want fixed? Well, I don't know. That typically doesn't happen immediately. So I make sure that I address it in this email to them and I set the expectation for them of what's going to happen um, during the inspection process. This is a skip a lot, a step 
a lot of agents skip. Um, we tend to kind of ignore our sellers and think, oh, they've been through the buying process. They know what happens with inspections. They've read the contract, you're yeah, right. Um, but I, I let them know kind of, I, I set them up for, for what's gonna happen in the next 10 to 14 days, when that appraisal is gonna happen, what's gonna happen at the inspection, who's present at the inspection, big please note here, the delivery of the inspection notice and resolution, if applicable, will typically not occur the same day as the inspections. <laughs> per the contract, the buyer has up to 14 days to deliver. I say that multiple times in here. It's right up here in the first bullet point two. I think I say it right up here too. Please note, we normally don't receive the inspection report and details immediately. They are prepared. They are prepared. They're going to be stressed out. It's the most nerve wracking point of this whole process for sellers, typically. Typically. So again, that goes out to sellers right after we're under contract with those important dates and we set the expectations with inspections. And then as a seller's agent, I need to coordinate with the buyer's agent dropping off that earnest deposit, um, whether it's going to the title company um, or if they're dropping it off directly to me and make sure that I'm confirming that it's been dropped off. Um, that's an important step that a lot of listing agents don't do. And then they find out a week later that, oh, I forgot to drop off the earnest deposit. The buyers never gave me their check. I thought they were dropping it off and all of a sudden you're out of contract. Um, Again, when you receive that title commitment, you verify everything on it. It's, I think, even more critical when you're a selling agent to verify everything. Um, make sure you don't have any Erica and Eric Nelson issues. Uh, make sure everything is correct on there. Your address is correct, legal is correct, etc. cetera. Um, make sure you're coordinating and communicating with the buyer's agent about when that inspection is going to occur, what inspections they're doing. It's not out of your realm to ask ask a buyer's agent what inspections they're performing so you can prepare your sellers. Um, and then, you know, you're going to be the main point of contact for the appraisal. Um, the appraiser will reach out to you to schedule that appointment. And uh, you're going to have the responsibility of, of getting them access to the house and possibly meeting them at the house. Once you have the inspection notice resolution, you need to get it to your processor and to the title company. If there is a change in price or a change in terms, I usually give it a couple days and then even as a listing agent, I'm following up with the lender and saying, just want to make sure that you receive this. Um, you may have received it, but it never hurts to get it twice. Make sure that that buyer's agent sent that resolution um, to that lender. If especially more critical if there's a change to terms or a change to close date, a change to um, your purchase price or uh, seller pay closing costs. Very similar down here, your two weeks prior to closing. Um, again, I'm setting up that appointment with the, um, with the title company. I like setting those up. The title company knows that I like setting up my own appointment so they don't call and do it for me. Um, I coordinate the schedule of the walkthrough with the buyer's agent. And then I do have an email that also goes out to my sellers with their final details. So very similar again to what I send out for the buyers, um, you know, what they can expect when you're closing, what they need to bring, um, how they're going to receive their proceeds. If they want to receive them via wire, what they need to do, the walkthrough. Um, per the occupancy agreement, I explain to them how possession is going to work and how I'm going to coordinate that. And then I remind them with utilities that they need to call and have them disconnected. I'm also reminding them um, that they need to call their homeowner's insurance as well. So very similar details in that one um, to what's in the buyer one. It just flipped. It just flipped. And then arranging, you know, closing gift. Same thing on the buyer side. One week prior, I'm doing a final check with processing, looking in SkySlope, making sure that I don't have any trailing or missing documents. Um, I've been in touch with the sellers. Uh, you know, throughout, when, once we had a resolution done, if we've got repairs, I'm reaching out to them, keep them on track, make sure they're getting the repairs done. So I've got invoices and receipts to provide to the buyer's agent before their walkthrough. <coughs> and then upon closing, um, you know, make sure you pick up your sign and lockbox. I can't tell you how many buyers I've had closed and they'll call me a week later and ask me when the listing agent's coming to get their sign and lockbox. Um, and any marketing materials that you have inside the home, you, you wanna go ahead and take those out. 
Um, and then similar to the buyer side, you're going to update your CRM, update your mailing list, print final settlement statement, send your testimonial and claim your sale on Zillow. And then you also need to have a plan for staying in touch for your sellers as well. Um, the other thing that I recommend on both buyer and seller is be present at closing. Um, I can't tell you how many times I talk to agents and they always go for the buyers because it's exciting, you're handing over keys, and sometimes the sellers are not ex as excited. Um, and a lot of people don't show up for their seller closings, but it's still, you know, you need to be there and, and providing assistance and answering any questions um, that you might have. When I attend a, um, I'm gonna click through this because we've already talked about all of these. When I attend a um, closing for a buyer, I told you that I take a folder with, with me. And while I have everything digital and I'm gonna share with them the folder in Google Drive of all the documents, I like taking with me that printed out, the home information sheet, and then I print a full inspection report. Nobody ever prints those. And as soon as they move in, something's gonna go wrong and they're gonna call you and say, hey, I think the inspector missed this. Well, it's because they don't have a copy of the full inspection report. So I print it out, I don't necessarily print it out in color, I print the summary out in color, but I'm printing that full inspection report form. That's also critical if they have an issue right away and they've got a home warranty in place, that warranty company is gonna to wanna to see if they have a pre-existing condition clause, they're gonna to wanna to see that inspection report. So I explain that to the buyers when I hand it over to them, but I'm printing off a full copy of that inspection report. And then I've got the brochure in there as well from the home warranty. I don't print all the documents that they've signed. I share that with them in Google Drive um, but what I do print off for them is that home information sheet, copies of any repair invoices, receipts, et cetera, from the seller, and then full inspection report and home warranty confirmation and brochure. So they have all of that stuff handy. A um, couple of things, just reminders that I've got in here. This comes from the Above and Beyond Customer Service um, series. You know, during your contract to close, as I've said, and I'll say it again, your communication is going to be key. Make sure that you're also keeping up communication with the agent and you are, um, you know, keeping peace with the agent. It does not have to be a battle. It does not have to be a war. We're all working towards the same finish line. And oftentimes, a lot of the problems that come up contract to close um, result in the agents either miscommunicating or you know, getting their buyers or sellers all fired up about something. I try to take, I, I take the emotions out and work towards the goal. And I make sure that I shield my clients from if I've got a really crappy co-op agent, unless it's critical that my client knows something that's happened, I don't tell them I'm dealing with somebody that's really crappy on the other end, because what does that do? For my client, then it sours them. And then they think every point during the transaction, negotiations with inspections, if we have an appraisal issue, you know, when we do the walkthrough, they're hypercritical of everything. They think everything is going to be a challenge or an issue. And I don't need them stressed like that because it, it then puts stress on me that really is unneeded. Um, so do your best to try to keep up those um, lines of communication with the co-op agents. Some obviously are easier to work with than others. Um, but that's an important element in your contract to close to make sure you've got a smooth transaction. Um, you know, staying in contact with, with the main parties, your title company, your lender, your clients, your processor, and the agent. Um, you know, you've got to keep up that communication to keep things on track. Okay, what questions do you have? It's 1030. Um, we've got a couple of minutes. If you all can hang out for a couple of minutes. Um, if you haven't already and you came on late, make sure you throw something into chat, whether it's a hi, have a good day, whatever. That way I, I can keep track of who all was here. Um, what questions or what did I miss that, um, that you thought that, I, uh, that we should cover when we talk contract to close? Hey, Christian, it's Lisa again. Hi there. Can you hear me? Uh-huh. Okay. Um, I, I had to jump off there for a minute because I was we got the house. Um, the last thing I heard was um, when you were talking about the having the homeowners insurance go out there um, to check on the well, like we may have a roof issue. So how does right. that do you have to coordinate that with the sellers agent or 
How does typically, that work? Typically, the homeowner, the, in, the uh, homeowner insurance carrier is going to do a drive-by. On occasion, if they do a drive-by and they see an issue, they'll then want to send a roofer out or the, the um, carrier will want their person to go out. Typically, they do not go inside the house at that point. They're just doing a visual. So I will try to give the sellers and the, the listing agent a heads up when they might be out there, but oftentimes we can't control that. Um, so I just ask the buyers to let me know, you know, approximately when they're they're gonna fire up homeowner's insurance and do a visual out there, if they could let me know so I could, you know, let, let the seller know so they don't have some, some issues with somebody crawling around their property. But typically it's an exterior visual and it's normally just a drive-by and it usually happens without anybody knowing. So it's, it can be, tr that can be tricky to let the sellers know ahead of time. Um, but I try to just give them an idea. And if I don't know, I at least tell the agent that, you know, my buyers are, you know, gonna do what they should and shop for homeowner's insurance during the inspection time period. So if the seller sees somebody poking around, it very well could be homeowner's insurance doing their visual. And I just give my heads up. Um, the spreadsheet, I had a question in chat that might be relevant for everybody about that spreadsheet. So that spreadsheet is set up in Excel and I keep it in Excel. Um, and once you get into the spreadsheet, regardless of which way you go, it's, you have access to it right now in the agent training drive. Um, so if you go to, to Google Drive, again, make sure up here in the upper right you're logged in as Kansas City Homes. Um, go over here to Share Drives and go to Agent Training. And it's on the first page. I've got a link to it right here. It's right here. So you have access to this right now. You have you only access. So when you click on this, you're going to have an option. My options look different because I'm the creator of this. But what you're going to do is you're going to go to File and you're going to go to Make a Copy. And you're gonna make a copy of this to your own drive, or you can download it as an Excel. Um, if you don't like working in Google Sheets, you can download it as, as an Excel and open it, and then you can change and do whatever you want to with this thing. Um, and if you, as you're going through it, if you see something that you think I missed in it, by all means, please tell me, because it might be something that everybody needs. Um, but that, that's where that spreadsheet is right now. So I see heads popping up on the spreadsheet. So I know that you guys are finding it, which is good. Um, the other thing that I will tell you, you've got links in that spreadsheet to all these templates, but if you wanna jump in and just kind of see the list of them, I try to keep them updated. Um, right here in agent training, let me click back because I did that fast. Uh, your main page in agent training, right where you find this, the checklist, there's a folder called Christian's Templates, and this is where I dump all the templates that I have or that I create. That's, if somebody sees something that I do and they go, oh, can you share that? I try to stick it in here and I try to keep it organized. Um, this one I need to delete because that's not the correct template. Um, sorry, I just saw that. So I've got a couple of folders in here. This, these are all the templates that are linked in that spreadsheet are right here. So there are a lot of them that I didn't show you today. Some of them are done in PDF. I try, I've tried to convert all of them over to Word so you can open them in either Word or Google Docs. So you can then take them, customize them, save them in Gmail as a template. If you didn't take the Tech Tip Tuesday last week, it's up on Genius. Let me show you something real quick that's kind of handy. So all those templates that I have, when I'm ready to, I've got to minimize this a little bit because my screen's below. Um, when I'm ready to send my finish line details, my templates, why is it not letting me go to templates? Well, that's messed up. Hold on here, something's not right. Try to hit refresh, I'm having technical difficulties. But I save all of these emails as templates. So then when I'm ready to send it, I'm not trying to go to Drive and copy and paste. It already is in my Gmail. I pull up my template. I make my little changes to it. Oh, come on, Gmail. Trying to go too fast. And then I can send. Um, again, that was we co I covered that in Tech Tip Tuesday last week. Um, if you go to Genius, at our video learning right here in G Suite is where that's going to be. 
I don't think I have it up there yet, but it's coming in there. There it is right here. Oh, it's on there twice. What do you know? Uh, saving a template email. So how you can save all those templates in your Gmail and then they're there and you just pop them in and send. But this is where all my templates are. Agent training, Christian templates, templates for buyers. And then I have all your templates for sellers. So this is something else that I love that I do for sellers. When I'm presenting to them offers, I present uh, this cover sheet, looks very similar to the one that I use for um, when I'm sending an offer for a buyer. I send this to the um, seller's agent. I can't tell you, I will tell you what, you all win multiple offer situation, do the little extras like this. Make it, make it easy on the listing agent. They will appreciate this. I attach it to the email and I also put it as a first document in dot loop, but it gives them a quick summary of um, the offer. This is what it looks like when I send it to the seller. It has the, the big terms here. And then I keep this blank because this is what I work off of as I'm having my conversation with them. I'm making my notes on here as to how we want to counter. And then I confirm with them, okay, this is what we're going to do. Yes, all right, I'm off and running. But it keeps me organized. It keeps my clients on track too. Um, you know, they get a 16 page document. They don't know what they're looking for, what to look at. So I'm obviously still sending it to them and explaining it to them, but that keeps me on track as I go through it. So you've got access to all these. I continue to add to this to massage them a little bit as we get new stuff. Um, you'll notice on that, on the seller checklist too, there's a whole lot of good stuff up here that we didn't even cover today about pre-listing. Um, you know, some of the stuff, you know, supplement cover sheet, um, you know, I've got video tutorial in here about setting up your um, showings on, on showing time. I'll continue to add to this spreadsheet as I make new videos or I've got the, um, the need to make any, any tutorials on all of these. But uh, I added this one yesterday. Um, this is, you know, after you do a listing, it goes live, you need to watch your email for that boost by HomeSpot or free three-day social media ad, right? Um, if you don't, you've got to take action on that. If you need a quick video, I think this video is less than a minute on how to um, customize and launch your free ad. So make sure you're taking advantage of those. I am amazed at our adoption numbers on those and why everybody isn't doing those is beyond, it's beyond these. I know that some houses sell before you even get the videos or even get the link, but um, take advantage of the stuff we have. All right, any questions or any other thoughts you all have? as we wind down here on contract to close. Thank you all, I appreciate your kind remarks in the, in the chat. Thank you very much, I love doing this. Um, as you can tell, I love it. Love being able to help you all, love being able to help you all save time, make you more money. That's what, that's what I'm here for. If I can make it easier for you, I'm going to. Have a good afternoon. I'll hang out for a few minutes. Um, I am going to stop recording, stop sharing, and I will um, hang out for just a few minutes if anybody has any specific questions that uh, they want to ask. <laughs>